I'm Andrew Maxwell, a comedian. But in this new series, I'm on a serious mission to explore the world of the conspiracy theorist. Tonight, 7 7. The top of a bus has exploded. The bombings in London in 2005 was the most shocking event in recent British history. Four suicide bombers killed 52 innocent people and injured over 700 others. Unbelievably, there were a number of conspiracists who doubt the official version of events, and some of them believe the British establishment was behind this tragic day. This is to continue the wars in the Middle East. This is to get the resources that we need to continue into the 21st century. I think that's nonsense. So I'm taking four of them on an extraordinary journey to see if I could change their minds. It's not going to be easy. There's no evidence to suggest they boarded the carriages. It just seems incredibly, incredibly coincidental. It's me versus them as we go down the M1 from Leeds to London to see where the attacks happen. We're going to try and do this. Have your instructions and your flip cams. We'll meet eyewitnesses. We know what happened that day because yeah. we were there and relatives of victims. There's a huge space here where David should be. They'll be confronted by experts. To suggest that the government would carry out an attack against its own people, quite frankly, ridiculous. There'll be arguments. I'm not saying who did it. I'm don't not telling me who you think I did. don't know who did it. Fallouts. Don't bollocks personally attack me. It's be bollocks. Right. Off made camera, it no more of it. And tears. It's not, it's not something that should happen to people. As we travel through the day that changed London forever, welcome to Conspiracy Road Trip 7 7. How are you? John. Hey, John. Good to meet you. Yeah, welcome on board. Welcome on board. Hi, Andrew. I'm, I'm Davina. Hello, Davina. Hi. So Hi. it's the name. Hello, Tony. Hi, I'm Layla. Hey, Layla. Come on board. Thanks. Bing bong! Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. And welcome to Conspiracy Road Trip 77. Begin. Okay. Obviously, you're all on the bus because you have various doubts and suspicions about the official version of events around 77. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah. Let's see what we can find out. Tony, an ex-security worker and CCTV expert, believes 7 7 was carried out by the government. Tony Blair was a neoconservative, and um, I strongly believe that it was, uh, under the Blair government, it was a purely political, motivated false flag operation. Leila, journalist and part-time model, thinks the official story doesn't add up. Our government covers things up and doesn't deal with things properly and lies to us about it and does things in secret. That's pretty terrifying. Or even the, the incredibly scary thought that our own government could blow us up. John, a political activist, believes 7 7 was to help the Blair government continue its war on terror. No members of the public ever want war because usually it's a son or a daughter that is being lost in that war. So we needed that excuse. To, to continue this war. 7-7 was our excuse. Davina, a law student and recent convert to Islam, doubts whether the four Muslim boys were to blame. We don't know enough about them, you know, whether or not this is something that they were capable of, especially. Uh, I mean, it is a very big deal that they, their personalities weren't explored. That, that's a bit of a shame. I mean, there's, there's Back in the 70s, the cops in Britain did fit up innocent Irish people for terrorist bombers. I mean, to have a giant suspicion of the British establishment, I can understand. But does that all add up to Blair and presumably Brown? And at least a dozen of them would have had to be in on it. Did they all conspire to then blow up loads of other Brits in the city centre? It doesn't add up for me. Over the next week, each of my fellow travellers is going to challenge me on a conspiracy theory they believe proves the official version wrong, and that the four men who were blamed for the attack were set up and weren't responsible. Our first stop on our road trip is here in Beeston, a poor area of Leeds and home to three of the bombers. Mohammed Sadiq Khan, Shazid Tanweer, and Hasib Hussein. 
The first conspiracy theory comes from Davina. Davina. So one of my main concerns in terms of uh, the bombers is um, where they've come from, so their background. She can't believe these young men could have been terrorists. You know, have they done it, you know, because they've been forced to do it? I don't understand enough about these, these four people to be able to conclude that they were capable of doing such a thing. 20-year-old Davina spent her childhood in America and converted to Islam just after 7-7. Now that I am Muslim, I guess, yeah, sometimes I feel like, you know, people find me suspicious. I sometimes feel, you know, people stare at me a little bit more. I want to find somebody in Beeston who can get us into the mindset of these supposed terrorist bombers. Detectives from West Yorkshire moving door to door in the Beeston area tonight. Shame has overwhelmed these families. Oh, wait, turn the camera off! They don't want to be seen on camera. Oh, I've oh, been brutal than that. Oh, because enough times when, when, it, when, it, when the 7 7 all kicked off, half of them were saying stuff like, you know, when they were talking like, yeah? and they were getting all twisted and exactly. the opposite were getting written in the papers. Since 7-7, it's difficult to find anyone who's willing to talk, but I've persuaded Sasha, a single mother of four. She lived opposite Shazad Tanweer and knew all three of the beasts and bombers. OK, everyone, this is uh, Sasha. Say hello. Hello. Hi, hello. Sasha. Hi, Sasha. Uh, can you take us around some of the spots? Definitely. Where they hung out? Yeah, absolutely. What's it like around here? It was better before, I must admit. Now, everybody's scared to talk, no one's... You know, every, it, it's just changed everything. We feel that they're suspicious of us, being suspicious of them, you know, yeah, the Muslim yeah, community. Cycle. So this is the house here, and you come up, third one, third block, you've got... This is Shazad that you're talking about now? Yes. This, is, this was his this house? This is his house, yeah. 22-year-old Shazad was a sports science graduate and lived most of his life in Beeston. Worked in the chip shop at the top of the street. I was in there on the Tuesday before 7-7, so that would have been the 5th. And he was saying that he was going to London, and they said, uh, asked, one of his mates asked if we were going on the train, and he went, um, we're hiring a car. You know, and he was just all bouncy, and like, just like he was just telling his mates, yeah, it's sort of, you know, a day out, we'll see. 18-year-old Hasib Hussein, the youngest of the bombers, was still living at home with his parents. 30-year-old Sadiq Khan was the oldest and well-known in the community. Sadiq was a teaching assistant. He's got a little girl, a little baby, what, you know. And the police used to ring him up and say, can you come and help us out with this? And like I say, um, he was taken on a tour of parliament by uh, our Leeds MP. And why would you do that with a terrorist? If you just look out the window, we're coming up to the Hamara Centre, which was reported as being a terrorist recruitment building. You know, it was ridiculous. Anything to do with being healthy and happy is what goes on in that building. It's all good people doing good work, and they were all sullied by this. To my surprise, our local resident, Sasha, seems to be supporting Davina's view. Those were good Muslim boys. They went to mosque, they weren't terrorists, they worked in the community. I really don't believe that they were going to London to kill people. So, there yeah. you go, that's my stance. Thank you. What I could gather, Sasha was saying that, that these men were innocent, uh, that there was nothing unusual about them. If you were about to carry out something, you know, that horrific, you would keep it on the down low. I don't think there's anything she said is persuasive either way. It just gives it a little bit of context. To counter Sasha and Davina, I've contacted a Muslim academic who specialises in the psychology of terrorism. OK. Hello, everyone. Hello. You all right? Hi. This is uh, Dr Russell Razak. He is a psychiatrist who specialises in the mindset of terrorists. I thought it might be quite illuminating, particularly for you, Davina. Yeah, I mean, I've studied a number of terrorists over time, the 7-7 bombers, the 9-11 guys, and a common theme for everybody who's, almost pretty much everybody who's known them and met them, that's family, people in the area, neighbours, is usually one of enormous surprise. The, what's his name? Hasib Hussain's mum uh, called 
uh, the emergency services when she heard about the bomb because she thought he was a victim. She had no idea. And that really is how it works. So with these guys, they were sequestering themselves in the um, Hamara Community Centre in uh, Beeston, where they would spend, you know, hours and hours for kind of weeks and weeks on end until 2, 3 o'clock in the morning. The place was closed, but they were the only ones there. It's almost like they enter a parallel universe where just them and a few other people know about what they're talking about and they don't include anybody else in that. The grievance can start from a legitimate concern. I was, mean... Was, a, a, was the invasion Iraq, of Iraq... Was, yeah, was, without was doubt. Big... Yeah, without doubt. That was one of the biggest... one of the single biggest recruitment causes for the 77 bombers, as far as I'm concerned. I mean, the stuff that I researched, um, in terms of the actual recruitment process, videos of the Iraq war where people, innocent uh, women and civilians, were being killed were used as part of the recruitment and they were shown to people and that was really going on. Now, if you add that to somebody who also has experienced uh, some, uh, potentially some racism or some difficulty within their own personal life, you can conflate those two things. That's when that grievance can really quickly become toxic. The doctor was very insightful. I think he gave me quite a bit of a psychological analysis on, on what he thought the bombers were like in, in particular. There are, you know, some gaps in the evidence. There are some bits and pieces that, you know, haven't really been explained a lot. Davina is impressed by the psychiatrist. But those other questions mean she's not giving up on her conspiracy yet. Next morning, we're leaving. Our four coach trippers are going to recreate the exact journey the four bombers took on the morning of 7-7, as they left Leeds in the early hours for London. At 3.59 on the 7th of July 2005, the bombers are caught on CCTV, leaving Leeds. Their first stop is the Woodall petrol station just outside Sheffield. So this is the service station where they stopped and um, he, was, he was noted on CCTV going into the service station here on the M1. Shazad Tanwil. It's 160 miles down the M1 to Luton, where the bombers caught the train to London King's Cross. The next conspiracist to put forward their claim is 28-year-old John. He works for a political group known as We Are Change. Can I just give you one of these each, please? It's very important information. We Are Change hold people accountable in positions of power, whether that be in politics, whether that be in finance or in business or in, in the corporate world. There is a lot of stuff going on under the radar that the people don't know about. John believes the train times were falsified by the government. They actually made reference to the bombers getting the 7.40 p, uh, a.m. train from Luton to King's Cross. Twelve months later, it came out through various sources, through Freedom of Information Act requests, that that train didn't actually run. Um, the Home Office then had to backpedal, the police backpedaled and said that the bombers got the 7.25. The, the issue here is that if there is one piece of major glaring information that is wrong in that account, what else in the account is also, you know, fabricated or not true or potentially, you know, wrong? Our conspiracists think that even if they had caught an earlier train, it would have still been difficult for the bombers to have reached their destination on time. They feel the official account just doesn't add up. We're going to try and do this. We're going to try and take... 724 train. Each one of you is going to take the identity stroke journey of each one of the bombers and just see whether, time-wise, it is actually feasible. I have your instructions and your flip cams. John, you will be Mohammed Sadiq Khan. There's your instructions. Davina, you are Jermaine Lindy. Tony, you are Shazad Tanweer. And finally, Leila, you are Hasib Hussain. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't suggest you uh, out loud say anything about bombing on a on the film, but just try and match it and let's see whether, how close we can get to the official account. Here in the car park, the three Beeston boys were joined by Jermaine Lindsay from Aylesbury. According to the official report and the CCTV footage, they set off from their cars at 7.20. Everybody all right? Mm -hmm. Even doing it as a, something like this, it's nerve wracking. I find it 
just nerve-wracking. We've got three minutes to get our tickets yeah. and get on the train, get on the platform, get on the train. Right, do OK. This. Let's do it. We'll see you at the other end. Oh, OK. Actually, it's not that long of a walk at all, is yeah, it? Yeah, it's not a long, it's not a long walk. And we're heading now to the station entrance. Just take a shot of that CCTV camera up there. It's quite important. That's the shot that took them. They're seen entering the station at 7.22, which gave them only three minutes to buy their tickets and catch the 7.25. There's a man at the ticket machine. Yeah, it's 7.22. I'm starting to fret that they're not going to make it. I mean, we told them not to run, but also not to just sort of stroll along either. Okay, so we've missed the 7.25 train. So we're going to have to get the 7.32. Now, John's made the fact that we're going to be pushing it, and I've just said, yeah, we are. We, I need to detonate mine at 8.50, which is an interesting statement in front of everyone. I suddenly realised what I'd said. Now on the train, I want my team to find out if it's possible to reach their central London destinations by 8.50, when the underground bombs exploded. Do you think that we would have caught the train, you know, if we hadn't fiddled around at the ticket barriers? I would have done it in time. I don't understand. There's loads of city boys, there's loads of people in suits, there's loads of people, men and women just on their way to work. be quite easy to get through uh, with a rucksack bomb on your back, very easily indeed. So uh, I think at the rate we're going, I will be on time. So I'm catching the Piccadilly line service to Russell Square. We're going down the escalators. You know, it's quite a long time to think about things. They would have had to have a lot of guts. They would have had to have, you know, true belief and true confidence that, you know, this is what they're doing. They're doing it for the right reason. They would have had to just keep repeating it to themselves. So I've arrived here at 8.39. It's just taken three minutes to walk down some Pancreas Concord. Let's get to the underground. Thank you. So, 8.35, I'm now boarding the train to Oldgate. This is 8.51 and we're now pulling into Oldgate Station. They would have definitely been on schedule to do what they did well within the time, with approximately, in fact, on time, which is very spine-chilling. Tony, John and Davina all make their destinations by 8.50, the time the bomb simultaneously exploded. The Allgate blast killed eight people, including Tan Weir, and injured 171. I'm very shocked by, uh, by all that. I timed it. I don't know if something went in my head as if to say, good God, you know, you could, you, this, this is something that could have actually been carried out. And I think at some point later in the day, I'm going to have a bit of a, an emotional moment with myself. The Russell Square explosion killed 27 people, including Lindsay and injured over 340. Things had to be planned quite precisely for everything to have been happened at 8.50, 8.50, 8.50 .50 consecutively. It has made me doubt the official narrative in terms of like, time speculation like a lot. At Edgware Road, the bomb killed seven, including Khan, and injured 163 people. I've got no discrepancies with the timings. I think that, you know, it's more than likely that they could have got to those locations in the, in the times that we are given at 8.50. I'm still not totally convinced that, that they knew what they were up to, or if, they, or if they did know what they were up to, that they weren't somehow coerced into doing those deeds. Meanwhile, the youngest of the group, 18-year-old Hussein, was pacing the streets outside King's Cross. One theory is that um, Hasib Hussein just freaked out and had started to do very, very irrational things. And he walked in a pretty much a straight line into this McDonald's. Mobile phone records show 
that he tried unsuccessfully to contact his three fellow bombers. He was here for 10 minutes, 10 whole minutes by himself, and in that time he called his friends. The other school of thought is that um, he was innocent, that he was some kind of patsy, and that he was just worried about his friends and wanted to check if they were okay. Now, Hasib Hussein boarded the uh, number 30 bus. The number 30 bus was rerouted to Tavistock Square due to the tube bombings. This is the BMA, the British Medical Association, on the corner of Tavistock Square. This is where the fourth bomb went off. At 9.47, the bus bomb killed 14 people, including Hussein, and injured over 110. Hello. Hello. Well? Oh, my goodness, what a journey. I feel like this guy was really, really lost and did not know what to do. And Hello. just, yeah, and aborted his mission, perhaps, and then went Changed back to it in the best way that he could. Still, from your experience of, of the four, mm. it could have all happened within that time frame. Oh, totally. The coincidence that the bus was diverted to the British Medical Association, a building full of doctors, makes my conspiracists very suspicious. It's just good fortune. What's it's central London? There's, there's doctors everywhere. Yeah, I, I find it unusual that that was the only bus that was taken control of by the Met, trying to make it look like the authorities had everything under control. And, you know, if I was pushed to it, I think I would say that. Really? Yeah. You think that there's elements in the government that would murder civilians? Oh, absolutely. For a PR stunt? Oh, absolutely. Well, it's not really? a PR stunt. This is to continue the wars in the Middle East. This is to get the resources that we Another need to continue world, into the 21st century. Really? Yeah. Do you think that's how the world works, no, mate. It's, it's not quite oil. Um, it's on the issue of the geopolitical landscape being re-sculptured for, for big private enterprise. Yeah. For that. example, if you bomb... Uh, let's say you're going to bomb Iraq. Right, so, so you're yeah. saying it's big business, this? It's big business, absolutely. You think big business? There could be a big business element to it, yes, absolutely they could. Next morning, it's Tony's chance to introduce one of his claims. And it centres around one of his favourite subjects, CCTV. Well, what we're going to look at next is the uh, is the CCTV issue surrounding 7-7. 42-year-old Tony is from Selby, North Yorkshire. I'm Tony Topping, and uh, my inter I'm actually a lecturer and researcher. Um, and before that, I was involved in security, although I can't go into too many details about what that was all about. So far, we've proved the bombers could have got there in time. But there is no CCTV evidence after this image in King's Cross train station actually showing them on the tube or the underground platforms. The police service received no warning about these attacks. I'm introducing Tony to Brian Paddock, who is the Deputy Assistant Commissioner of the Metropolitan Police on the day. One of the sort of key parts of, uh, about the 77 conspiracy theories is the CCTV footage, or okay. lack thereof. Tony, do you want it? Yeah, well, my background security as well, and I used to liaise with the police on CCTV issues. Mm -hmm. But yet on the actual day of the incident, uh, we find nothing on the underground to place the bombers at the scene of the crime. And I wondered if you could shed any light uh, on it. Uh, I don't know, to be honest with you. Right. Uh, it could be a whole host of reasons why that, that footage is missing, other than it wasn't those guys who did it. The system isn't recording properly. Uh, one of the cameras is out. Uh, the recording medium was full. And a whole series of systems that operate that could fail that result in an incomplete picture. The difficulty with it is, of course, it raises suspicions amongst right. in people's minds. Yes. But the fact is that there is other evidence to place the bombers at the scene in terms of DNA and so forth, and identity documents and, and that sort of thing. So. Um, unfortunately, CCTV is, is not always complete. Thanks, mate. How is it possible, how is it feasible that in the most surveilled city in the world, all the CCTV footage has either disappeared or didn't work? On the bus it didn't work, OK, I'll let that go. But on the tube, apparently, there was 20 minutes where all the CCTV footage was down that morning. I'm sorry. It reeks of an inside job. 
I would like to see some CCTV evidence of them boarding the train. For me personally, as a personal choice, I would like to see that, and then I can say, yeah. Brian hasn't persuaded Tony or John at all. I wonder if meeting somebody who experienced the bombings firsthand may help convince them. Jackie Putnam witnessed the Edgware Road tube explosion. And thank you for meeting us, Jackie. <clears throat> So you, on the day of 7-7, you were on the Edgware Road tube? Yes, I was. I walked past Siddiqui Khan. I walked further on mm -hmm. and got on the train in the next carriage. I know there's a lot of the survivors of the attacks have had different conclusions about what happened that day. Well, we know what happened that day because yeah. we were there. Yeah, more, more importantly, I we mean, saw it. Who, who caused it, how it was caused. Well, we know who caused it. On my train, it was Siddiqui Khan. Yeah. They made sure they left enough evidence that it was them. Um, and plus, they were seen. Um, I've spoken to Danny Biddle, who's the worst injured survivor. I mean, there are people who say there's, there's no way of proving that even these four men blew themselves up. They well, Danny it. saw Siddiqui Khan reach down and detonate the bomb. So I don't understand why people would say that, mm. you know, that doesn't make any sense. He stood on that platform when I walked past him and looked at me and thought, you might die today. He didn't care what kind of person I was. Mm. He was gonna do that. You, when that happens, when people are blown apart in front of you, when you just got on the, on the train on your way to work, you don't see the world in the same way anymore after that. You, you live in a different place and you have to spend the rest of your life in that place and come to terms with it. You know, I mean, Jackie, I can relate to Jackie because, you know, she reminds me of someone that I really care about. And I'm sure a lot of people on that on that train as well that went through something similar, you know, you could sympathise with them, you can empathise with how they felt that day. And, you know, it does, it does get to you, you know, I'm beginning to make a bit of progress. Jackie is convinced Davina that the bombers were definitely on the tube and capable of committing the murders. My conclusion is that the boys were definitely there, atrocities did occur. It is something they could have been capable of. So that's where I stand at the moment. But John is more difficult to sway. You know, in all due respect to Jackie, there are other eyewitnesses that have said that they saw where the bomb went off, and there was nobody standing there. There wasn't a bag there. There wasn't an Asian man on their train. So at the moment, I'm totally, you know, in two minds. Tony's fighting back. He's going to present what he thinks is the ultimate conspiracy, that even if the bombers were on the tubes, they were just innocent bystanders. These four men were hired as patsies. Patsies meaning four guys, patsies meaning people who were set up to do something. So I think that these men were hired as part of a training drill. They'd been hired as actors. These four guys are actually setting out to do what they do and be known to them as a secondary operation running of more precision, which is intent on... Inflating parallel. Card. Yeah, parallel. It's parallel. John agrees with Tony and has more to add to his theory. It's been established there was a mock terrorist exercise going on in London on 7-7 using the same tube stations as the bombers. John thinks this was a government cover-up for the real attack. One of the major smoking guns for 7-7, for me, has got to be Peter Power's drills that he was running on the morning of 7-7. Peter, um is from uh, Visor Consultants, and I'm right in saying, Peter, that you actually advise firms on, on how to deal with terrorism incidents, and you yourself were in, a, in a, a training session this morning? Yes, it's a strange thing. In all my time at Scotland Yard, dealing with events like this every week, 
it never happened to me that we were running a training session and suddenly the real thing happened. But it happened to me at about half past nine this morning, ten minutes walk from the studio, thousand people in a major office in the city of London. The scenario was simultaneous bomb attacks in central London, the crisis team were there, and we had an unreal few moments. Is this part of the scenario? Have I managed to pull something off that they are going to pay me lots of money for or something? And all of a sudden we decided to call, stop the exercise, go into real time. I'm sure if people were just to look at the facts, you will be able to actually see it for what it is. Peter Powers declined to be interviewed, but made a statement. The actual exercise was planned to take place in a single room in central London with six people sitting around a table. Everything was simulated in that room. Although I have been happy in the past to clarify with anyone, all too often this has done nothing to assuage the rather weird beliefs of some who, exploiting their views on the internet, seem convinced my company was involved in a conspiracy that day. I'm not saying that the people who are running the drills are actually involved in the actual terrorist events. That is a parallel part of the operation. The drill is there to cover the real event. What are we saying, John? We are saying that no, the, the same days the governments bombed themselves, they were running drills to cover it over at the same time. That's what we're saying. I mean, from You're accusing likely, your country think, of killing its own people. I think it, it, Very serious accusation, right? I'm not saying who did it. I'm not, tell me who you think. I don't it. know who did it. If I knew who did it, we, you know, maybe I'd be in court trying to prosecute them as opposed to on a programme with you trying to disprove what I'm trying to say. John is struggling to prove his point. To support his case, he wants me to meet somebody on his side. He takes us 200 miles north to his hometown. We're on our way to meet Dr. Naseeb. He thinks that one in four Muslims um, doubt the official story, the official government narrative, home office narrative to 7-7, and that there is some type of conspiracy behind that. After the 7-7 bombings, the imam of this mosque, Dr. Nassim, distributed thousands of copies of a conspiracy film. It argued that the British government planned the suicide bombings to incite hatred against Muslims. This is Andrew. Hello, Andrew. This is Layla, Tony, and Davina. I have massive questions. A few years ago, I, I came to see you and, and, and spoke to you about those doubts, and uh, these guys share partly some of my beliefs. There's a lot of mistrust about the government. The political leadership is considered to be a bunch of liars. Oh, yeah, you know, absolutely. Okay. If you agree with that, then anything they say is a lie as well, isn't it? People can be liars, but they would not be necessarily murderers. Is that not true, Doctor? Well, they can lie about murder. What role do you believe these four men played in it? I don't know. I don't have the evidence. I mean, because they're, obviously their bodies were found there. Uh, yes. 56 people died. It was a horrific um, action that was taken. But who did it? That is a question which is not being answered. We had a meeting with MI5 here in the mosque. Okay. And I put it to them, surely when you have reasonable evidence that this man is going off the rail, we will go collect the whole family. We can stop it before anything happens. Okay, God bless. Thank you. All that he would accept was that uh, amongst the dead on the day were four British Muslim men. That was it. None of the other evidence to suggest otherwise he either didn't know about or he completely dismissed. Now, Andrew's questions were probing, but Dr Nassim's answers were minimal, but was giving good retorts. Um, he was able to sort of answer the question with another question, will you show me the proof? The saddest part of all was the bit where he said that his, that the, that his mosque could have spiritually steered those four men away from what they were doing. Tony seems to be tying himself in knots. How can the man in the mosque have prevented the men from doing the bombings if they were meant to be patsies? I'll explain again. A group of four Muslim men. Mm -hmm. They have they have outside influences who are going to approach them to commit an act of violence. Mm -hmm. Okay. There is a spiritual ministry within the mosque that would have steered them away 
from committing the act of violence, mm -hmm. haven't they, at all, My question... Yeah, because that makes perfect sense yeah. that it's right. Yeah. Um, but your theory all the way along has been they were patsies, they didn't do it, they didn't know what they were doing, all that kind of stuff. No, 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 that's not what, no. I think you're just exploring avenues. I'm exploring avenues. Let's do some research. No, 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 I'm just asking you what your theory was, and you got all defensive and weird about it. I'm not defensive, I'm not weird, I'm trying to explain to you. Perhaps I shouldn't get so angry, I get very worked up and then I, I lose my focus and get angry and people think I'm, I'm directing my anger at them when really I get upset about what I've seen. I don't quite understand why he was so upset, but you know, all I said was, that sounds contradictory, can you explain it to me so it isn't contradictory anymore? Tony is obviously the die-hard conspiracist and, you know, he's a self-described die-hard conspiracist. He's somebody that, you know, I've started just for my own amusement, making up bullcrap stories and saying, hey, Tony, how's this for a scenario? Can I put a scenario to you and mm -hmm. see what you think? I mean, if, if um, somebody was warned about this, mm -hmm. you know, this is going to happen in the next few days, maybe the training exercise was to not make people panic. I've just got some dots and someone completely unconnected dots and connected them together and gone, how about this, Tony? And he's like, yes, very astute. You know, that's that, very, to me, that's a bit more likely than the government actually orchestrating the entire thing. very astute, doesn't it? He's not interested in the truth. He's interested in his version of events. Now it's time for Layla herself to have her claim examined as we head back down south. Thirty-two-year-old Layla is from Staffordshire, and her journalistic background forces her to question everything. I proofread articles for magazines, and I did this for a magazine that was about alternative subjects, and I had to proofread a load of conspiracy theories. I started to think, oh my God, that's weird, and that doesn't add up, and very strange that there's lots of different versions of events here. It's very strange that things are so secretive. Her big question surrounds who actually detonated the bombs. What I heard was that the bombs were already in the train. That the bombs were set off remotely and they were underneath at the bottom of the train, um, as opposed to, you know, the official version of events, which was that they were carried in, in a backpack. I want them to meet Chris Hunter, a former army bomb disposal expert and intelligence officer, who is now a counter-terrorism consultant. Well, basically, the first thing you look at is where the majority of the damage is inside the, uh, the structure. So, obviously, when you look at, you know, for example, the Aldgate device, you can see there's very clearly a hole in the bottom of the carriage floor and significant damage directly above that, too. I, I heard that everybody that was sat down on the tube was more badly injured than everybody that was standing up because the bombs were underneath the carriages. Could that happen? Um, is, is that the way these things...? It, it wouldn't really be be consistent with it. Mm. If you had a bomb underneath the train, the chances are it actually cause it to derail. And you didn't see anything like that at all. What you saw was, you know, uh. very, very typical of a blast going down, going up, and then traveling through a carriage that was full of people. It's just like basically, you know, when you've got a small pond and you drop a stone in there and you see the waves going outwards, and then as they hit the edge of the pond, they start to come back inwards again as well, you know. So you could Suck some floor back you up. You could basically blow it down. Is it and that then, powerful? Yeah. We knew that from also the fact that there, were fragment, there was fragmentation in these devices as well. Basically, you know, bits of metal sellotaped to the, uh, or taped to the actual bombs themselves. And those were used to effectively enhance the damage to the, uh, the individuals on, you know, on the carriage itself. That is absolutely shocking and I'm shocked. I'm shocked to hear that and I, I, I didn't know that. And this is nowhere on any of the conspiracy theories that I've read. What they do is effectively, if you've just got explosive, you get blast damage where, you know, as if the blast isn't damaging enough as it is, they actually add nuts and bolts and things. So you get these sort of, you know, critical um, puncture wounds effectively. I, I've never met anybody who's in, in the, uh, has any connection to the intelligence services. You're the first person, so it's just, from your own personal experience of working in that field, what is the feasibility of even an element of the British Security Services doing this? To suggest that the government would carry out an attack against its own people, um, I, I just think is, you know, quite frankly ridiculous. It was a very, very clear explanation of how a blast affects people. 
seeing and speaking to a proper qualified expert or somebody that's you know actually been through the experience is completely different to sitting there on the internet reading some self-proclaimed expert who could be absolutely anybody. Layla's finally turned away from the conspiracies. But what about the rest of them? I'm quite frank about this. I don't know what's what's going on now. I don't know what side of the fence I'm on. I'm looking at the internet. I see this, that and the other. To be frank, at this moment in time, I don't know what fucking side I'm on with everything at the moment. I don't know whether I'm coming or going with it. But what's happening, Layla, is we're being challenged from another dimension. But that we're being challenged by by a public narrative, a proper narrative that everybody considers to be the logical explanation. Well, and it our, is no, it's not. No, it is not logical. Why is it, it could, not the logical explanation? Because it could be a possible lie. Because it could be a possible yes, lie. Yes, it could be a possible lie. Do you realise how ridiculous that sounds? No, I don't realise that at all. The thing that pisses me off about you and the thing that pisses me off about you is neither of you understand logic. Oh, give over. No, 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 no. You no, have no, a problem no. with logic No, no, thinking. not at all. Not in I don't agree with you, I'm sorry. Yeah, well, you do. I you don't do. agree with you, I'm sorry. I don't agree with that at all. Do you know what? I've got a confession to make, right? I've been, just to see what you would say, coming up with wild speculations and this theories wild and throwing speculation. them at you just for fun. No, it's not. And you've been going, hmm, very astute. Yeah. And I've been doing that on purpose yeah. and making up some bollocks. No, you haven't. And giving it to Yes, no, I have. We've no, got it on camera. No, you haven't. You, you, on I've, third, I've fed you some bollocks no, as a haven't. possible scenario. No, no, you haven't. And you've gone, hmm. No, because it's a valid scenario. Don't, don't. No, 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 it's not. It's don't bollocks. Don't personally I made it attack up. me. It's of, bollocks. Right, I off made camera, it up. no more of it. No more of it from you now because obviously you're personally attacking me and I'm not having it. I don't want to comment any more on it. I'm not personally attacking you. Yes, you are. I don't want to have it anymore. No more. Well done, you. Well done, you, Leila. Yeah, well, well I'm, I'm kind of pissed off with the oh, whole thing, Oh, of course to be you will be. OK, well, that's fine, then. I'll tell you what, for the rest of the three days, don't bother. Don't come anywhere near me if it's that, if it's that bad for you. I think that's enough. That is enough. It certainly is. Shocking. Absolutely shocking. He was just getting on my tit end, basically. He was just getting on my nerves because he would just not be logical and he expected me to believe everything he said just because he said it, and that's irritating. I'm very upset about what has happened today. Uh, there, there is no other way to describe it. I, I'm keeping my emotions in check, but frankly, I could just burst into tears with it all. It's upset me greatly. I, I sense that he feels shaken by how horrible the world is sometimes. That's my sense, and it upsets him. And I think he feels better having somebody to blame and having a mission of feeling like he's doing something about it. It's the last day, and there's one more conspiracy claim left, and it's another of Tony's. You've been led to believe that it was homemade bombs that blew up the number 30 bus. But there is reports in the press that military-grade explosive material was found at the scene. I don't think that homemade bombs would be able to cause the damage at the level and weight that were in the rucksacks. Take a look. 18 Alexandra Grove. This is the Leeds ex-council flat turned bomb factory that the bombers used as their base. The police found buckets of sand-coloured sludge, boxes of hair dye and pans full of hydrogen peroxide. But could it have really caused this? We're going to find out. We're at a quarry in Wilshire to carry out our own controlled explosion using homemade bombs. Sydney. Sydney Alford is an explosives expert and has been tinkering with bombs since he was 11. He specialises in IEDs and has helped the army in Afghanistan. Right, well, uh, Sydney, uh, my friend here, Tony, uh, believes part of the conspiracy theory is that a homemade explosive yes. of that size wouldn't have yes. the the capacity to cause that damage. Yeah. Oh, I see. So you'd yeah. like me to settle that simple yes, absolutely. question? Yes, absolutely. Just don't fiddle with anything, right? Because if something... There's not very much nasty stuff there, but if there is something that's labelled with something naughty, it probably is something naughty. So, so no fiddling, please. Oh, so let's go and have a look at these thing, me, Bob. Are we OK to...? Yes, yes, Sydney. Using all the available information from the inquest, Cindy is going to replicate the terrible events of the bus bombing in Tavistock Square. 
This is my last chance to convince John or Tony they're wrong, so I'm hoping this experiment goes my way. was either on this seat or this seat. Mm -hmm. um, would you think it's likely that we're going to see the roof sort of being ripped off halfway and the back end being blown blown away? I'll show you. We'll, we'll break the windows. Um, I expect this will have to give. I expect that seat will be pushed down. Uh, I would expect the bus to be a write-off. I'll commit myself no further at this stage. Uh, in this container, I have black pepper, and in these two containers, I have hydrogen peroxide solution. I'm not telling you what concentration of peroxide is. I have to depend upon what is reported in various sources, and such things as a policeman reporting that he smelt pepper after the bang. Mm, that's a pretty, pretty strong clue, because if something smells like pepper, guess what it's likely to be? I'm just cutting across in the plastic to facilitate pushing the detonator in. Oh, it looks so tiny down there. It is really On the other end of this is our bomb. Here we go, people. Could a homemade explosive blow up a bus? Does everybody now believe that homemade bombs can blow up a bus? Yeah. Everybody convinced? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah? Wow, look at it, look. Look. Can it blow the roof off a bus? Looks mm -hmm. like homemade it. Homemade explosive? Everybody convinced? Yeah. Tony? Yeah, absolutely yeah? convinced, totally. Stuff that anybody can get their hands on. And we've got it on camera and the other camera down there. Whisper. You know? You want to whisper? Yeah, you want to whisper, yeah. Kind of a bus. It's a bit of a bus. Watch that line there. Moms, babies, commuters, tourists, everybody gets on a London bus. Surely they'll now accept the facts of what happened on that terrible day. Next time you're speaking to anybody on the internet who says that a uh, homemade explosive can't do this. Right? Mm-hmm. I can't disprove everything to you, okay? But can you just have some more fucking doubt in these online idiots? John? Does this make any difference to you? Well, I mean, it certainly makes a difference. I had heard those things. I don't subscribe to them. I'm not, I'm not a chemist. I'm not a bomb expert. Um, you know, I'm just a bloke. And yes, you have proven to me that a, a professional can make a uh, hydrogen peroxide bomb with black pepper and uh, rip the roof off a, off a London bus. Prove it to me, mate. Prove it to me. Just, you've proved it. That's it. End of. I think you've got to be sensible with it, Andrew, and you've certainly made me wake up and smell the coffee on the issue. Definitely so. I just 
It does my head in. I don't need it anymore. I just don't. It's doing, doing my fucking head in. I'm certainly going to uh, uh, put to bed, I think, the CCTV one um, and the bus one. So, you know, I think, I think we can, we're heading down the road now of it being a complete and almighty cock-up rather than a conspiracy. Failings in security, failings in surveillance. It, I, I have to say, I didn't see you t taking this route at all with it. No. You know, at, the, at the start, because, no. I mean, there's, there's all sorts of carry-on. There is a portion of my mind, there are some unanswered questions, but um, I've certainly woken up to be more sensible about the information that I'm looking at. Uh, I certainly have. It's almost the end of our journey and we're visiting the 7-7 Memorial in Hyde Park. I want the group to meet Graham Fox, who lost his son, David, in the bombings. Graham, thank you for coming. Andrew. Hi. We, we got here a couple minutes before you and we uh, saw your son's name on the memorial. Uh, David was 22. And in, this was his first trip to London on the underground on his own. And he stood next to the Siddiqui Khan. Somebody said to me that uh, the first Christmas, the first birthday, the first anniversary are difficult. And you get through those and after that everything gets easier. It's simply not true. I mean, standing here now by the memorial and the, these columns here are for the Edgware Road people, the six people that were killed in Edgware Road. And I feel uncomfortable and it, it's a, there's a visceral feeling that overwhelms you. I, th there's a huge space here where David should be. And I, I don't know, people talk about black holes in space. I've got my own black hole and it f comes with me everywhere. Do you still feel angry about this or do you feel less angry or more angry about it as time has gone on? I'll never, ever stop feeling angry about the death of my son. Mm -hmm. And when you know, when you, when you read into it and you get to see as much as I and many others have, yeah. there is an anger at being let down. Yeah. In the build-up to the attacks, we, we'd heard that the security services had been noting Sadiq Khan for a number of years. But at the inquest, we found out they'd actually been training him since the year 2000. They knew he'd been to, to Pakistan, to terrorist training camps, twice. So they knew that he was an active bomber. They knew he was actively involved in terrorism. And yet they st still allowed him to get through. If I let him get through, you're not saying they deliberately let him get through? I'm saying that the systems that they had in place were inadequate and they allowed him to get through. There's nothing in the conspiracy theories. There's nothing of substance, absolutely nothing. The main areas that concerned me uh, how could MI5 follow Sadiq Khan for 10 years? That is an area of concern. Because obviously I think, well, if, they, if they'd done their job properly, my son would still be alive, and so would 51 other people. We're at the end of our trip, and I want to know whether I've succeeded in changing any of their minds. I don't think there's a conspiracy. I just don't. Some of the coincidences are so startling that you can't help but think, oh my God, that must, you know, it must mean something. But then again, some of the coincidences are equally amazing, but meaningless. Davina, you know, this whole thing could have been extremely awkward for her. Her key thing was a good point, you know? It, this seems so out of place. I think that definitely they were there and, you know, they do have the capacity to commit these atrocities. And, you know, at the end of the day, for me, like, there is still a lack of information in terms of, you know, what happened after the incident and, you know, reasons behind why these men did what they did. But I do believe that what happened and what was done was done by these men. At the start of this trip, I was like, there's no moving on this guy at all. I'll be honest with you, I'd almost written Tony off. <laughs> Mr. Topping. Mr. Mr. Maxwell, sir, 
Well, oh, what have you started here with me, matey? Goodness gracious, mate. Really? Yeah, it's been quite an experience. I'd like to thank you for it. Um, it's been amazing. It's certainly matured me. Uh, it, I couldn't explain what that maybe meant to you, but it, it's just uh, the, the research I've been looking at and all that kind of thing. You have to be very careful what you look at. You have to be very sensible with it. And I've clearly seen now that a conspiracy can be blown out of all proportion and it just grows like a virus um, and it can affect incidents, it can affect lives, it can affect people. And that's probably the equation that is missing from the conspiracy theory. The victims with conspiracy theories have no say. So surprising turnaround for those three. But there remains one more coach tripper. You know, John took bits and pieces on board. He accepted when something we could kind of irrefutably prove, AKA, yes, homemade explosive can do extraordinary damage to a bus. But ultimately, he's coming from a different worldview to me. Mr. John, Mr. Scobby. Of course, it does not mean, Andrew, that those guys did do it. That does not prosecute those four men. So I do maintain that 7-7 is a justification to continue these wars in the Middle East and um, continue empire building and to continue British imperialism spreading across the world. For me, this film's a love letter to the city I love, man. I love London. The idea of somebody attacking it like they did, it's like killing a loved one. But it's conspiracy theories. You know, they feed off suspicion. Well, who am I to tell you not to be suspicious of the media, the political class, or the cops? I don't blame you. I am too. But does that add up to a giant murderous conspiracy? I don't see that.